pleased and honored to be invited to speak today. Uh, Lula talked about city, and yes, uh, we restructured city. We're back to the basics of banking, which is to serve the real economy. We connect the world for our clients as America's global bank, and we're committed to practicing responsible finance. And what I mean by that is for, before we enter into any transaction, we ask ourselves three questions. Is this transaction in the interest of our client? Is it systemically responsible? And does it add any economic value? And the answer has to be yes. Otherwise, we don't do it. Uh, what I want to talk about today is something different than city a little bit different than financial institutions, although it will be apparent as I speak why this topic is absolutely critical, not only to the health of a financial institution, but also to the health of America. I want to talk about what I consider to be the defining issue of our time, which is the relationship between U.S. and China. And it's a little presumptuous of me to come here and talk to you all about that topic, I mean, you know it well, you know the facts extremely well, and the Committee of 100 has been a vital voice in deepening that relationship and furthering understanding on both sides. Uh, but I think it is the important issue of our times, and your role as the Committee of 100 will only grow as the importance of the U.S.-China ties intensify. Just a couple of days ago, I was in Washington with uh, Secretary Clinton, Secretary Geithner, Secretary Locke, and, uh, and this was a meeting of uh, delegations on both sides. Premier Wong, Vice Premier Wong was there, and uh, State Councilor Dai, as well as a number of China's most prominent business people. Uh, and it was a great dialogue. And we, I am, and City is proud to be part of this U.S.-China strategic economic dialogue. And one thing I'm really encouraged by is that uh, Secretary Locke will be America's new ambassador in Beijing, and I'm very confident that not only will he represent our country well, but bring the two economies closer together. Uh, we at City have been long in China. We started in 1902. We started in Shanghai. Today we have 5,000 people. We have retail branches in 13 cities around uh, the country, and we increase more branches every time we get permission to add another city. And we also have a number of joint ventures, including one with the Guangdong Development Bank and another with Shanghai Pudong Development Bank. Uh, we're also, as Lulu said, uh, a part of the founder's circle uh, of the State Department's 100,000 Strong Initiative. This is a program that was designed to enhance America's understanding of China by increasing the number of American students who live and study in China. And over the next few years, we at City plan to provide more than 100 internships in our offices there uh, in Beijing and in Shanghai. But mutual understanding has never been more important. Uh, senior government officials and business leaders on both sides of the Pacific have called the Beijing-Washington relationship the single most important bilateral relationship in the world today. And they're exactly right. But I'd go further. It's not merely the most important. It's also unique. Not only in our time, but also in history, great power rivalries are common. What's unusual is a situation in which the world's two leading powers are partners across a range of globally important issues. Now, that's not to say that the US and China don't have their differences, but I think it's more constructive to focus on what's working and those areas where it makes sense for the two countries to work more closely together. Now, Lulu was clear, I am a banker, and uh, I'll tell you that bankers are not usually good politicians, and so I'm not here to give political advice. But instead, what I want to talk to you about is the collaborative role that our two economies can play in driving world growth and how that role is changing. We at City maintain a presence not only in China, but we have a physical presence in 101 countries around the world, and we do business in 60 more, which is what makes us America's global bank. And I'm con in constant touch with our people on the ground, with ministers, with central bankers, uh, with companies in many nations, and I also do a fair bit of traveling myself. Uh, 
and most of our employees and our clients as well as government officials uh, that I talk to see the U.S.-China relationship in fundamentally the same way. And that's the perspective that I'd like to share with you today. We're uh, the two most important economies in the world, and not just because we're the two largest. Our importance goes much deeper than that. The U.S. is the world's largest economy. It's the largest consumer market, one of the largest manufacturers, and still the biggest innovator. In other words, the U.S. economy has the single greatest impact on global economic aggregates. So the U.S. sets the averages. And while the U.S. does set the average, China drives the margin. It's not only the world's fastest growing economy overall, China is, has also the world's fastest growing consumer market and is increasing the pace of its resource, resource usage faster than any other country. When you take these two economies together, the two economies drive the prices for virtually every important commodity in the world, from food to energy to raw materials, and in large measure determine what kind of jobs are created, where, and at what pace. The rest of the world's economies not only feed American and Chinese consumption and growth, they either ride the wave of our success or suffer when we stall. Therefore, it's clear to us and clear to me that our countries have two very important responsibilities. First, to manage our own bilateral relationship well. And second, to jointly manage how the two of us together affect and interact with the wider world. I will touch on the second, but I'm going to spend a bulk of my remarks on the first. To borrow a Chinese metaphor, over the last few decades, especially before the financial crisis, the U.S. and Chinese economies have been locked in a yin-yang relationship. They are like complementary opposites that together form a whole. And neither, I would argue, is a well-balanced economy in its own, but together they set the pace for the world. For most of the duration of this relationship so far, the U.S. pursued a growth model that was based on consumption fueled by debt. China grew by increasing its investment very rapidly and by vastly expanding its export sector and by investing the resulting surplus cash mainly in the U.S. Well, we now know that that model had some real limitations. It produced illusory growth in the U.S. for a time, the U.S. has been left with a mountain of debt that could take decades to pay off. Millions of jobs have evaporated, many in industries such as construction and mortgage brokerage, and that are not really going to return to their former strength. And as America's export and manufactured, manufacturing sectors atrophied, the U.S. economy lost much of its crucial diversification. The financial crisis clearly exposed the weaknesses of the American economy and it allowed Americans to see that we face some serious structural issues, including the massive public and private debt, unsustainably low savings rate, huge trade imbalances, and lackluster exports. Now, there are some who believe the Chinese model is a lot better, and yes, China weathered the crisis more quickly with less pain, and it avoided most of the worst problems that we face here. And it did so while racking up incredible accomplishments. China's GDP has grown roughly at 10 percent per year for decades, rising 20-fold in the last 30 years. China recently overtook Japan as the world's second largest economy and, and more importantly, depending on how you measure it, it is now either the world's number one manufacturer or just behind the U.S. No other country in the world's economic history has risen so far and so fast. The only considerable parallel is Japan in the second half of the 20th century. At least until the Nikkei and the Tokyo property bubbles deflated in the early 1990s. But it is true that the high savings, high manufacturing, export-driven model clearly holds some attraction. 
but the Chinese model faces its own challenges and ones that the Chinese government is aware of and is working to address. The first is the high savings rate. It's completely understandable, by the way, why the Chinese people are such diligent savers. Many feel economically insecure. The social safety net in China is less developed than that in the U.S. Capital markets are still in the early stages of development, making it necessary to save large down payments towards purchase of property or consumer durables. But all that money has to be invested somewhere. And given Chinese constraints on cross-border capital flows, this high level of private savings can't flow out of the country and find productive investments opportunities abroad today because only the government lends to the international markets. As a result, we can't be truly confident that what investment that does play, take place is happening efficiently. And more importantly, as too much money chases too few opportunities in the domestic market, asset price inflation is inevitable. The second is the Chinese consumer market. And the Chinese consumer market hasn't yet close, come close to fulfilling its vast potential. A savings rate of 53% translates to rates of consumer spending that are well behind China's peers in the developing world and even lower than countries that have markedly lower per capita income, that's such as India, as an example. In addition, household disposable income makes, us a makes up a surprisingly low share of Chinese GDP. Wage income is only about 45% of GDP compared to 65, 75% in the advanced industrial economies. China consumes only 35% of its annual GDP, a rate that's far, far lower than other BRIC countries and half the level of the U.S. I think the Chinese government and everybody understands that this low level of consumer spending could limit China's future growth, especially as consumption slows down the Western economies. And Vice Premier Wang, who I met a couple of days ago, said exactly the same thing to Charlie Rose. Uh, China faces an imbalance between savings and consumption, and it's an imbalance that is almost the mirror image of the imbalance that troubles the U.S. economy. As a matter of fact, if China's savings rate is too high, America's is too low. China's consumer spending is too low, America's is too high. America is burdened with excessive public and private leverage, and China accumulates more capital than it can productively invest at home. China lacks a sufficiently robust safety net, whereas America's safety net is fueling our debt problems and need reform. America runs a massive trade deficit, while China maintains a surplus. We all know that these imbalances aren't good for the American side of the equation, but they're unlikely to be good for the Chinese side as well. And the Chinese government officials seem to understand that very well. When China recently announced its five-year plan, it specifically talked about the need to rebalance its economy with a greater emphasis on domestic demand as a new source of growth. Chinese markets are increasingly opening up with an emphasis on industries that are high-tech, high-value added, and low energy consumption. But there are some very difficult decisions that the officials still face, and there are no easy answers, there are only trade-offs. For example, making the currency convertible would go a long way towards solving the liquidity problem and addressing inflation, but it might also exacerbate unemployment and slow growth. So the dialogue continues, but there's reason to be confident that China will find the right balance. On the other side, the U.S. side. We have no choice but to get our country's finances in order. Second, we should work on correcting our trade imbalances, which means addressing the consumer-producer imbalance in our domestic economy. Third, we need more economic diversification. Fourth, we need to advocate for and help create a better and more productive protective environment for intellectual property around the world, and we need China's help to accomplish that. I'm not going to say much about the first point, 
Governor Christie was extremely articulate about the need to bring down the debt and, and approach our country's finances with real discipline. I will only say that one never sees growth without confidence, and a credible plan to address the debt is necessary to restore confidence, which in turn will inspire real investment. But when I look at the other three things that we need to do in America, they all boil down to one big need, which is America needs to become a bigger exporter. China may now be tied or close to the U.S. in total manufacturing output. Each country generated about two trillion in manufacturing. But there is a difference. The U.S. did that with 11 million workers compared to 100 million on the Chinese side. The point of that is the U.S. remains a manufacturing powerhouse. But we at, in America have become, especially compared to our peers, a weak exporter. According to the National Association of Manufacturers, among the world's 15 top manufacturing economies, the U.S. ranks only 13th in how much of that output we export. Only Brazil and Russia score lower. Stated differently, we're 55 percent below the world average in the share of our manufacturing output that we export. For the last few decades, consumer demand in the U.S. and elsewhere in the developed world helped the emerging markets build their export and their economies. In the process, not only did we consume too much, but crucially, we also didn't focus enough on, on stimulating demand for our goods and services in other countries. So the remedy is absolutely obvious. The emerging markets are developing enormous consumer blocks. Around the globe, millions of people rise above poverty and enter the middle class every year. By one estimate, some 70 million entered the middle class in 2009 alone. According to another estimate, by 2020, three quarters of the incremental consumer spending will come from the emerging markets. And if that turns out to be true, then Asia will overtake North America as the world's largest consumer bloc. So I see this rising economic power as an opportunity for American businesses so that they can help kickstart our economy and correct our consumer supplier imbalance by reviving our export sector and by selling to the emerging market consumer. That means maintaining a strong commitment to free trade the three pending trade agreements with Colombia, with Panama, with South Korea, and many more to come are very critical for the U.S. economy and for expanding American exports. But as noted, by far the most underdeveloped consumer market among the world's major economies is China's. The rise of the Chinese consumer is not just an opportunity for American business. It is and should be seen as the culmination of decades of reform and progress by the Chinese government. Rising incomes mean greater opportunities and higher living standards for the Chinese people. So the issues I've discussed today uh, here are domestic priorities for each nation, and each nation has to confront them separately. And as the world's two largest economies for the foreseeable future, we have an interest in helping to build and support our international system that is not just based on our own interests, but also in the service of a broad-based growth strategy across the globe. And, and I mean it when I say that, again, through my travels, it's clear that all the economies in the world look to ours for direction and for much more. As the leading average and marginal consumers and price setters for the world, we're also the primary direct and indirect sources of world's jobs, and the need is enormous. By some estimates, just to recover from the recession and to keep ahead of demographic trends, the U.S. is going to need 12 and a half million jobs for the rest of this decade. That number for China is more than 20 million. That number in India is 88 million. Africa is going to need 125 million. Latin America, another 44 million, 
And when you add up the entirety of the developing world, we're going to need about 400 million new jobs over the next decade. That's almost 40 million jobs per year. Chinese and American focus up to now, and especially in the wake of recession, quite rightly, has been on creating jobs in our own countries. I, I believe it's no longer going to be enough only to focus on our own growth, but it's in both countries' interest to work together to think more broadly. First, because our own growth increasingly depends on the economic health of other nations. Second, because that growth depends on the political stability of other nations, which is determined in part by their labor markets. Third, because we are increasingly producing in global supply chains that depend on cross-border trade and investment flows. And finally, because it's simply the right thing to do. So this relationship between China and U.S. is remarkable for its unprecedented nature. Our collective task is to keep it that way. Devolution into trade wars or worse uh, would fit the template of history, but I don't see that happening here. I really don't. In any case, history always is what leaders make it, and everyone in this room is a leader, and I thank the Committee of 100 for leading the U.S.-China relationship in a direction of greater cooperation, and we at City are doing our part. We're working to do our part for the benefit of both countries and for the benefit of all the world. Again, it's been my pleasure and an honor to come here today and, and address you with what I think is the single most relationship that's going to define the world over the next decade. Thank you all.